All right, here we go. Welcome. Welcome to the panel on new old trade corridors. Uh, my name is Chitra Narayanan. I am currently a strategic advisor for corporates and think tanks on um, cultural sensitivities on doing business with Southeast Asia and uh, uh, China and Turkey. Uh, my background is of a journalist, then a career diplomat and an ambassador of India to six countries, Sweden, Latvia, Turkey, Switzerland, the Vatican and Liechtenstein. But my background is of modern Chinese history. And uh, I am half Southeast Asian. My mother is from Burma. So I have, this is my, uh, it is also my home in Southeast Asia. We have a very distinguished panel with us today. I'm happy to introduce, and I'm going along as we appear on the screen, Dr. Ikram Thagal. Bill Nguyen, Will Lau, Kolapo Lawson, and Megan Lee. I will invite each panelist to please introduce yourself. Yourselves, please. Dr. Ikram Sagal. Uh, I'm Ikram Sagal. I'm the chairman of Pathfinder Group, which is a diverse group of two uh, basic things. Uh, one is in security services. The others in financial services and technology. Uh, we have about uh, 12,000 people in the group. We were founded about uh, by me actually in 1977. So this is our 43rd uh, in, uh, in existence. Uh, we are into a, a lot of things, uh, and particularly in technology. And in technology, we are the only. Um, a company that is given the PSO PSP license and and the TPSP license for you know for mobile uh, as a mobile payment gateway in Pakistan. The switch is almost the same. We have something the, the Pakistan uh, government launched a financial inclusion scheme to include 80 percent of the uh, population which is not having uh, bank accounts. And with that particular switch, anybody can open a bank account in one minute. And uh, with any with 15 banks which have participants of this thing. Uh, my background is uh, basically before I went into business was military. Um, as you can see, um, uh, I was uh, an infantry officer and also a helicopter pilot. My uh, special interest with this group is because I actually was attached to the Chinese People Liberation Army uh, in 1970 as a helicopter pilot when they were making the Karakram Highway. Did they, at that point of time, the Chinese did not have helicopters. So uh, I, we with the Pakistan Army, provided these helicopters for the two divisions that were making the Karakram Highway. And I was attached in the picture that you see behind me is of me at that time. So um, uh, I have a lot of interest in this because I saw this thing happening before my eyes. Of course, as a young man, I could not even imagine what it was going to be 50 years later. But uh, let me tell you that this is so exciting. And in my presentation, I'll try to explain to you why. Thank you for giving me this time. Thank you very much. I will, may I share with the participants that we are very delighted that uh, Ikram could join us. He has, it's still 
just recovering from COVID-19. And we are so grateful and appreciative that he is taking the time and the effort to be with us today. Thank you so much. Bill, please. Hello, my name is Bill Nguyen. Um, my background is finance and uh, I was a, a university professor to teach finance for nearly 10 years. And then I opened my ABS Institute where I do, do offer the uh, training to CEO and the uh, manager in my country for nearly four years. And then we see the program is um, that the young people don't have the ability to get advanced education. I mean, the education from uh, developed countries. So we build the e-learning with the MB, with the uh, purpose to offer of the cost with a purpose, uh, affordable cost to the young people to um, get advanced education. And last year we see that many schools, many companies, many in the center they need the e-learning, and then we launching that product to our country. We are very successful on that one. And this year we launching the uh, video conferencing and chat and Zoom. But the difference is we sell the whole system of video conference for, for customer to build their brand name with their logo, their domain, their own domain. Unlimited cost, unlimited user. And next year we will launch an e-commerce platform education only in Southeast Asia countries. With the birth, with the purpose of every young people in Southeast Asia country have the ability to uh, take advanced education with the minimum, minimum fee. Uh, because um, I, I was brought in the very, very old, very, very, very poor uh, childhood. So I know that many people, young guys cannot, uh, Tech advanced education. And what about the problems? Uh, myself, my companies, and my country. At COVID 19, we cannot pause in podcast for future for 10 years. Thank but you, Bill. We'll go into that later. Meanwhile, very briefly, we do this introductions. Will? Yes, Thank hello. You. I'm Wei Liao. Uh, I'm a co-founder of Seven's Technology, which uh, which is a digital health company based in Hangzhou, China. So we are kind of combining uh, virtual reality and uh, AI technologies uh, uh, to develop a brain function rehabilitation services or products for the patients with uh, with sub 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 addiction issues or. Uh, stroke recovery issues or uh, uh, dementia issues. So we, we are working very closely with uh, government sectors in China, like uh, like 80% of government rehab centers are using our service and uh, our products currently. And we are also re well recognized by our Department of Justice. Uh, so as we expansion to the in international markets, we see both opportunities and the challenges uh, w working ahead of us. So it's very interesting to talk about this kind of issues currently, especially under, uh, uh, under the US-China war and uh, COVID-19 and uh, uh, RCEP, this kind of issues. So it's uh, glad to be here and thanks for inviting me. Thank you, thank you. Kolapo, please. Your mute, your mic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, um, Chitra. Um, my name is Kolapo Lawson. I'm from Nigeria, which is the most populous country in Africa with 200 million people and counting. And Nigeria is also the biggest economy in Africa with huge opportunities. Um, I'm the chairman of a diversified group, which was actually founded by my late father, in 1964, so I'm second generation um, running this business. We have um, a major interest in real estate, building housing, 
infrastructure, industrial parks. Um, we've built the first um, integrated industrial, um, residential, and commercial um, park on 454 hectares just outside Lagos. And so it's virtually a small town by itself, and we're doing some other similar projects in other parts. But that's why our company is called Land Africa. We develop land in Africa. Um, we have also started developing ties with Asia, especially China, because we have promoted together with um, my son, Shegun Lawson, who is the CEO, a company that's now um, building the first industrial gold mine in Nigeria. Um, and that gold mine, or the, the company has investors from all over the world because it is listed in Canada. And we have investment also from Chinese interests. And the EPC contractor building the mine is um, a Chinese company called Norinco. And we have recognized that there are now huge opportunities for stronger links between China and Asia and Nigeria in Africa. That is why I'm really interested in this um, Horasis session. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Thank you. Yes. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Megan. I come from Shanghai, China. And um, I studied economics and MBA. And I'm the founder and CEO for uh, Emiga Industry. So basically, we are a manufacturing and engineering uh, company, especially for the cement industry, uh, such as the um, environmental projects and like ESP, uh, back later, waste data recovery, power generation projects, and also uh, for some um, like capacity uh, modification and technology modification product projects. And meanwhile, we also have uh, uh, export and import units for cement spares and equipment. And we also, uh, I'm very glad some panel based here, we mentioned that you are doing the business in China as well. Uh, we also involve some kind of infrastructure business uh, in Pakistan uh, and also in uh some other countries, but in cement industry business, we mainly uh, doing in uh, recently we, we have the branch offices and also the partners in Indonesia, in India, and in Pakistan, and in Vietnam, and also Egypt, and some other countries. And um, I'm very glad here to share some experience and some information so what we have done and what we are going to do. And also, uh, very welcome some people who are interested to uh, discuss the opportunities or corporations in China and also in other countries. Maybe we will have um, a wonderful uh, brainstorm here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Megan. Now, what I will do is after a brief introduct introduction, I will pose a question to each participant uh, in which I will request you to talk for just two minutes, two and a half minutes, and then maybe two other uh, two other questions. And after this, after each participant has finished responding to this, we can have a discussion firstly amongst ourselves before we go to the Q&A. Uh, I'm sure all of you are experienced for us as um, participants. I myself have been participating for uh, six years and always on uh, subjects which are close to this because it's a subject close to my heart. When we talk about the Silk Road, we have to go back really to 2000 years when all the great civilizations were trading with each other. And so we talk from the Eastern Mediterranean to Central Asia, ancient India, ancient China. And perhaps what is uh, sometimes forgotten, that this was not a trade route right across. It was a route of a series of links, these great pathways of exchange and commerce. It was a series of links culminating in Central Asia, 
and you had the trade coming into say Bukhara and then from China also to Central Asia and going back with their with their products and uh, you have this wonderful Sogdians who were the middlemen who facilitated this trade what i'm trying to project is that for the our friends who are not from asia sometimes forget that this was a this was a gateway it was a it was a full of activity of exchange of commerce of of ideas of religion of culture and this is what we can see today so it is so interesting and i think uh, really relevant when in 2013 president xi jinping outlined his uh, vision of one belt one road in kazakhstan when he was giving his address at the nazarbayev university and this was as you all know formalized in a document in 2015 the, the it consists of two concepts the belt which is actually a road from inland china through central asia towards europe echoing the historical silk road and then the road which is actually a maritime belt inspired by the ancient historical sea trading routes in southeast asia from coastal china through the south china sea indian ocean east africa right up to the mediterranean and in 2016 it was became to be known as the belt road initiative so this bri envisages building a network of connectivity through infrastructure railways airports ports through projects involving the 129 countries and 29 international organizations through mous and intergovernmental agreements it goes well beyond the historical roots encompassing asia africa and europe and in 2017 the first belt and road forum for international cooperation was convened in beijing and this is uh, to put it into a context text this is my view that in 2000 by 2013 the chinese economy was peaking there was a fear of overheating western china remained less developed in comparison with the dynamic east and the south xi jinping began to consolidate his power and replaced uh, uh, the technocrats with with more uh, party oriented leaders he resurrected maoist themes assumed the traditional image of a strong party leader even adding his thoughts on socialism with chinese characteristics in a new era to the constitution in 2018 a new strategy was required by china to cover all these issues as a strategy the belt road initiative is brilliant and the founding of the asian infrastructure investment bank a perfect companion uh china's greatest success was due to this formidable development of infrastructure and with its time to export this expertise far and wide developing countries were and still are struggling to build roads highways ports airports railways and lack the expertise and finance to make it possible western countries and donors were not prepared to invest without intricate and heavy conditions enter the belt road initiative with loans expertise and labor china leapt into this vacuum offering projects 2020 will always be known as the year that was not while asia has come to grips with covid-19 and has started its economic and health recuperation the rest of the world is still struggling to find a uniform strategy to overcome this china is turning inwards concentrating on stimulating the domestic economy and market as the first steps to an economic recovery i will now go to each participant as appearing on the screen and request them to say within 2 minutes a few words on their experience in their personal 
company as well as their countries regarding the Belt Road Initiative. I start with you, Bill. Two minutes, two and a half minutes. Please, Bill. Bill, you please have to unmute your mic. He hello. Hello. Um, to my experience um, uh, about the belt, belt, the belt road, I, I think uh, my country can get benefit to do the co collaboration with the uh, uh, companies in China, in India, because of that now, now we, we see that the um, on it, it, it companies they have a small benefit from uh, collaboration. Uh, even I myself in South Asia country, I can do offer online training to the people, so they may just wonder to go to to study and then they go to work. So we we get benefits. Thank you. Will. Yes, uh, I will. Uh, uh, it will for two levels. First is uh, like a uh, personal, like company level. Uh, first is uh, our uh, our company is a tech company, so we have to uh, cooperate with uh, universities or academics to transform technology into application level. So the, uh, and the, the application level will be some will be government sectors or will be business sectors. So we we are doing this well in China right now. So we are expanding to uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia com uh, countries in uh, like Philippines last year. We uh, with this kind of uh, in uh, uh, Silk Road initiative, this kind of thing, we our government is like promoting our, our companies to do business in South Asia, Southeast Asia countries or African country, U European countries. So last year we successfully invited uh, a Department of Health people in Philippines uh, to visit our company and to visit our uh, health system or, so we can change uh, knowledge or uh, change uh, suggestions to each other to p promote for the people's better health. And uh, this is great thank thanks to the uh, Silk Road Initiative. And uh, the second is the uh, uh, country level, like uh, our country uh, uh, this year has implemented the foreign investment law, a, a newly for foreign investment law uh, to allow like allow countries to investment in, in China. And uh, we also open our financial market and our uh, tech, 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 tech uh, uh, open, open the market entrance to the financial industry and uh, to the tech industry. I think uh, lots, of, lots of change has been taken in China uh, uh, for the market in entrance um, to embrace the global business environment. So this is two parts I, 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 I share with you. Thank you. Thank you. Pulapo, we eagerly listen to you because Africa has been a great focus for the Belt Road Initiative. And Nigeria is the richest and most opportunity is there. Please. Yes, um, that's very correct. Um, there have been several projects um, initiated by the Chinese on the African continent. Um, quite a lot on the East African coast, um, culminating in, in China actually building a huge base in Djibouti. They're building railway lines, they're building roads in Kenya, in Uganda, and in Nigeria, they're financing a, a very um, modern and long um, railway line from Lagos, which is going all the way up to the north in Kano, which is about 1,200 kilometers. So there is a lot of activity. Um, but there have also been a lot of criticism in that um, there's some sentiment that countries are over-borrowing from China and the projects are not performing as um, efficiently as had been designed, opening these countries up to the risk of default. 
And in some cases, people are scared that China is going to end up owning um, infrastructure and assets on African soil. And this, in my view, is probably exaggerated, but it means that one really has to be alert in examining how these um, projects are structured. Um, mainly, they are intergovernmental projects, whereas I believe that there is a huge opportunity in private sector engagement, because there are many private sector organizations that are um, well-funded, that are organized, that have strong governance systems, and that can make good partners for Chinese and Indian and other um, Asian um, investors. So I think this area needs to be explored a little bit more on this question of um, private sector engagement. And of course, there's also the huge opportunity that has come up in that for the first time, the African Union has come together to say that African countries must work together. And they've now created the what they call the African Continental Free Trade Area, which is actually the largest free trade area in the world. Um, it brings together 54 African countries as one market. And this is um, an opportunity, I think, that can't even be measured if rightly implemented. It is meant to start next year, 2021. It was supposed to have been 2020, but COVID, of course, um, put paid to that. But it is meant to start in 2021. And this creates opportunities in all fields, in manufacturing, in infrastructure, in science, in education. Um, and this, I think, will be accelerated through private sector engagement rather than just intergovernmental relationships. That's what I would like to encourage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very important, and we can take it up in the discussion. Megan, please. Megan. Hello. Uh, I, I just would like to share some of my personal experience uh, during these years. So uh, we are very glad, and uh, I'm also feeling very honored we have already evolved and also engaged the One Belt, One Road projects actually before this initiative. Uh, uh, since uh, 2010, we have already uh, started uh, all of the <coughs> projects in Pakistan and also some other countries. And especially, we have done a lot of ESG to back later modifications in cement uh, plants and also some uh, steel plants. Uh, it's saving the energy and also it's improved the efficiency and also it's improved the ca capacity. And uh, the dust outlet from maybe over 500 MG and now up to our modification is lower than 550 MG, especially in some other special cases, it's lower 10 MG. So I, I think it's um, it's very um, happy to be involved in these uh, projects uh, in Pakistan, in Indonesia, in India, and in Vietnam, uh, in, uh, in and also Egypt, in many countries. Um, so for company, definitely, it's not only uh, doing business, it's also sharing the technology and that we sharing the countries uh, during we are doing all of the projects in the Gosha region and the uh, on-site discussion and everything. So it's definitely not only this, it's also the culture experience. And during this year's experience, I, I learned a lot from different countries. I know how their, their cultures, how our differences and we try to respect each other and we try to respect differences so i think it's uh it's very interesting thing, it's not only business it's also something else we, we learn together we learn from each other we respect each other and we try to go up more together and um, because for us the important thing is uh, as we know all know cement industry Steel industry, it's very heavy pollution industry. 
but what we are doing is we're trying to reduce our blood patients as much as we can. So uh, I feel like, uh, it's uh, it's not only benefit for our country or our, our company, it's benefit for all of the country involved and the people involved. Because we, 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 we want our uh, environment more cleaner, more friendly and more beautiful. So I definitely feel uh, very happy to be one of the people in this uh, initiative. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Ikram, we look forward to what you say. Ikram, your mic is on mute. Ikram, your mic is on mute. Hello? Ah, okay. While we wait for Ikram to come back, I think because we have only 15 minutes left, I'm going to change slightly instead of asking questions from each of you. I think we will develop certain themes. I think Kolapo touched upon very important aspect that in the case of the problems that could arise from uh, uh, and, and the various perceptions of projects under the Belt Road Initiative. Can I request if any of the other participants, Bill, Will, and Megan, have something to comment on what Ikram said? Uh, sorry, that Kolapo said, and then we will wait for Ikram to come back. Do you have anything more to say on what Kolapo mentioned? Yes, I can uh, say a little about uh, Kolapo says. It's, it's like kind of like... Uh, China may be doing too much in, in this initiative. Sorry. Uh, maybe China is doing too much in this uh, Bell Road initiative or in some projects. I think China uh, China's view or our uh, pres pres presidency's view is kind of like co co cooperation is not kind of like uh, dominating or this kind of thing. So I think it's more kind of like for business to work together to for the humankind it's not like like dominating or like uh, uh, back to the histories this kind of thing so uh, this is my point thank you ikram are you back ikram we are waiting for you ikram please yes thank you oops can you hear me now can we hear me now we can hear you. Yes, thank you. Welcome back. Uh, can you hear me, Chitra? Yes. Uh -uh. Ikram, we cannot see you or hear you. No problem. Here is a problem. Yeah. Please. Ikram? Ikram, we wait for your view. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please go ahead. Ikram, we wait for you. I think we're having a little problem from Ikram in Pakistan with the server, uh, but we will come back to him because we must quickly make use of the time. Okay, Ikram, please. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. All right, so we are back. Uh, Chitra, first of all, I want to uh, please correct one thing. The uh, You know, the BRI, the B uh, Belt Road Initiative, is of course a uh, President Xi's uh, initiative. However, the actual vision started uh, 55 years ago when China wanted an opening into the Middle East. And they thought about this Karakoram Highway, which they really the highest mountain in the world, 
and they pushed a road through the Karakoram Highway. Now, I want to give a personal example. As a young pilot, I was flying uh, this thing. My interpreter, who was Chinese, came straight from the language institute in Beijing University, right? And he, of course, he knew English and Urdu, etc. And one harrowing day, when there were a lot of casualties because of the explosions and things like that, building the road, I asked him. I said, "You Chinese are stupid. Why are you making this road? This road is from nowhere to nowhere. I mean, I cannot understand. I've seen Xinjiang province. There's nothing in Xinjiang province, right? And I, I, I said, what are you, where are you going to take? And what are you going to take down to Karachi? There was no Gwadar at that time. And this gentleman, uh, Zhang Xinjiang, he looked at me for some time, and then he told me. He said, no. We Chinese are not stupid. You Pakistanis are stupid. And I asked him, "Why?" He says, "Because we think in terms of fifty, hundred years. You think in terms of five and ten years. And we will go down to Karachi one day." This gentleman. This was nineteen seventy. In two thousand three, he became the Chinese ambassador to Pakistan. Mr. Chen, and he still brings me up every year and asks me this question: Who is stupid? Right. So. I tell you one thing. This was a vision. The China-Pakistan economic corridor is actually the, the gateway, in many cases, to a lot of places. But the BRI, and just to give you some idea of the BRI, it's a functioning reality. It's a functioning reality because it takes 45 days for a container to come by sea from Shanghai to Paris. By rail, it takes only 14 days. Now, rail shipping is cheaper than uh, 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 roads. Goods transported is much cheaper, right? Today, Khargos port at and Kazakhstan, they have clocked ten thousand trains from China to Europe. Ten thousand trains between two thousand fifteen, sixteen, and two thousand and twenty, right? And There are only five thousand trains from Europe to China, but this will expand. And the reason for this is one thing is, uh, which is very interesting, a Chinese uh, uh, um, train consists of seventy-five wagons. Sorry, of eighty-three wagons, whereas the the European train cannot have more than forty-three wagons. So obviously, the when the Chinese train comes to Kargos. Then it becomes two trains, and the European system is antiquated. Now, what is the China-Pakistan economic corridor? Once the road and the rail links are down to Gwadar, and we are expanding onto Shahbahar on the Iran side, and the network of roads in the regional cooperation of development with the Central Asia, Iran and Turkey, right? The road and the rail will connect through to Africa, to the Middle East, North Africa. And what we're talking about, Nigeria, we'll have a road and rail connection from China down to the south of Africa. So you have basically Eurasia, you have Southeast Asia, and you have, uh, of course, South Asia and Middle East, North Africa, as a huge melting pot. Now, into this, into this vision, has come something very extraordinary, and that is the pandemic. The pandemic has changed the world. Air travel. Think about. It. Think about. It. In any case, a freight is about ten um, uh, times the cost of a, uh, a train freight, right? It it will get you in five days from uh, from uh, uh, from uh, you know load it and then offload it from the thing etc. From door to door, door it takes you fourteen days on a train. But the point is, the connectivity, the connectivity. Now we in Pakistan. Are the gateway. We are the gateway. If we can only have a decent conversation with South Asia, with India, if India, the oh dear, entire South Asia, entire this thing, come are hostage because of the bad relationship with Pakistan, right? We want to extend that kind of friendship. We want that friendship to go because the trade that takes place, 
the trade that takes, the connectivity that comes through, the enormous benefits. Right? We are all right. In Thank Pakistan you. today, we are the to, uh, uh, to so the world. I, I think you have mentioned some really important points, and I'm completely in agreement with you. Unfortunately, we have very few minutes left, so I am going to touch upon a point that Colapo um, uh, mentioned in the fact of the, the perception of criticism of the BRI. I just want to mention, it, uh, is it not so that though there is a perception about China and its projects, it is up to each country when they reach this agreement or private companies to take care of its own interests. And if they do this meticulously, then where is the problem? There is enough. Um, there is enough for all to share. What do you think, Kolapo? I agree with you. Um, it's up to each one to be as meticulous as possible. Um, but um, experience has shown that private organisations are better at that than governments, especially in our parts of the world. That's why I am constantly encouraging. Um, private organizations to engage with each other, create governance systems, um, work with good lawyers, and make sure that they come up with agreements that are fair to both sides and that are justiciable, that can be acted upon in the case in case there are disputes. Um, and we have done that with this gold project that I mentioned. We have a Chinese partner, um, they are investors, and they are also the EPC contractors, and everything is going wonderfully. Um, we hope to pour the first bars of gold in the first quarter of 2021. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. I think that's a good template. I um, think it is a very good template. I uh, I see there's a big notice coming up on my screen that we have only three minutes left. <laughs> so I, there is so much to say. I'm extremely grateful, Ikram, on the points that you brought up because it really shows the Belt Road as it is functioning today and is functioning in the past. Um, and uh, to I, I, I want to thank each and every participant. We cover many continents sitting here. And for the really invaluable, invaluable contribution, I hope our uh, attendees have enjoyed it. But one thing I will say, I'm a great believer in the Belt Road Initiative because it is some, an opportunity for countries that did not have these opportunities before. And as Kolapo mentioned, with the right vigilance and legal uh, care, this uh, project can be uh, so important for developing. And yes, with, with, the, with the pandemic, it is even more essential that our economies can, um, can develop and grow. So uh, uh, Bill, Will, Kolapo, Megan and Ikram, uh, I thank you very much. There are all kinds of lights flashing on the screen, which doesn't happen when we are in physical. <laughs> I thank you very much. I think this has this has been fascinating, and I hope next year on another Horasis section we still are able to continue the discussion because there is so much more to say. Thank you all very much. Thank, thank you, Petra. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you all attendees for having come. We are very grateful. Thank you.